Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose blessed Son came into the world that he might destroy the works of the devil and make us children of God and heirs of eternal life, grant that having this hope we may purify ourselves as he is pure, that when he comes again with power and great glory we may be made like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom where he lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated for the lessons. A reading from the Wisdom of Solomon. Wisdom is radiant and unfading and she is easily discerned by those who love her and is found by those who seek her. She hastens to make herself known to those who desire her. One who rises early to seek her will have no difficulty, for she will be found sitting at the gate. To fix one's thoughts on her is perfect understanding, and one who is vigilant on her account will soon be free from care, because she goes about seeking those worthy of her, and she graciously appears to them in their paths, and meets them in every thought. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter of Paul to the Thessalonians. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so you may not grieve as the others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wife, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day Gospel of the Lord.
encourage one another with these words. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Grace to all those of you joining us here in the church, and grace to all those of you joining us online, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I was 12. My sister Olivia was 10. We were on the back patio, and I was teaching Olivia how to golf. I helped her line up her feet and grip the club in her hands and even take a few slow-motion practice strokes. Then I decided Olivia was ready to do it on her own. I stepped back from her before she made her swing, but I misjudged the distance. My sister's backswing, bam, right into the side of my mouth. The world was spinning, I couldn't feel my teeth, and I looked at my sister and I said, with my head in my hands, am I bleeding? Am I bleeding? And my sister did something I will never forget. She just burst into tears and screamed, ah! <laughs> <laughs> she ran as fast as she could inside to find my parents, and I ran behind her with blood pulling in my hand. I was bleeding, and my parents scooped us both up, God bless them, poured us into the car, and drove us to the emergency room. And on the way, my mom sat with me in the back seat. She put her arm around me and she said those magic words. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. My confidence in my mom, the trust that I had in her, it imbued those words with authority. If she said it was going to be okay, it was. And everyone calmed down, even me. There's nothing quite like those words, is there? It's going to be okay. Last week, I had the pleasure of having lunch with Graham Tomlin. Graham Tomlin is a bishop in the Church of England, and he's the founding director of a new interdisciplinary center in the Church of England called the Center for Cultural Witness. The center's main project right now is to bring the Christian faith and life to bear on pressing issues in the public square, primarily through a new online magazine that they founded called Seen and Unseen. It's riffing on the all things seen and unseen from the creed we're about to say. Seen and Unseen, the goal of it, the goal of the Church of England, is that this would become rather like the Atlantic, but from a Christian perspective. It's, it's very, very, very cool, the project. Uh, but Bishop Tomlin shared that when they were founding the center and thinking about the new magazine, they commissioned a sociological study of their target audience. And their target audience is, I'll just say, this is my description, not Bishop Tomlin's, uh, so don't hold him responsible for this, but uh, it, I would describe it as 30s to 40s, educated, a.k.a. people who live in Brooklyn. <laughs> right, that's the target audience. And um, the study came back to them with a surprising find. It was surprisingly consistent. There was an overwhelming consensus among people in this demographic, living in the United Kingdom anyway, I don't think it's so much different for us in the United States, that everyone in this demographic shared a common existential concern. They all had one deep question which gnawed at them, and they were trying to answer. They all wanted to know whether it was going to be okay. That's how Bishop Tomlin put it. The results of the study was that these folks in our culture, myself included, I fall in that demographic even though I don't live in Brooklyn. We just want to know, is it going to be okay? all the chaos and challenges of our world today considered. That's what I think all of us 
want to know. The Apostle Paul's answer this morning to the question, is it going to be okay, is yes. Paul this morning is writing to the church in Thessalonica, also known as Thessaloniki. It's an urban center on the Greek peninsula. It's a fantastic city still today. But in this period, early Christians, in the first generation of followers of Jesus after his death, Paul is writing only some 15 or 20 years after Jesus has died. This letter is the earliest text that we have in the New Testament. It's the one closest to Jesus' historical life. And Jesus is writing to early Christians who are living amongst culturally Greek Roman citizens who treated them with suspicion and sometimes violence. And Paul is addressing their existential concern. What's going to happen to their loved ones who died? Perhaps their loved ones who have died in Thessalonica. Human history, human life for St. Paul, it moves like an arrow. Human history and human life for Paul is not cyclical as you find in some other religious traditions. History is like an arrow. It has a destination of some kind. And that destination for Paul is God. All of history, all of us, we're all moving towards God. And like many early Christians, Paul imagines this destination of all of us, of all of history, as Jesus coming again. After Jesus died and rose, he ascended, returned to his Father, and that one day he would come back. So that's the language that he's using in our lesson this morning. And Paul is reassuring the Thessalonians that Jesus won't come again without those who have died. Jesus won't forget all those who have died whenever he comes back to fix things when he comes back to wrap things up and put a bow on the world, as it were. He's not going to forget those who have already died. And so what Paul describes is Jesus descending from heaven, resurrecting the dead, and then reuniting the dead with those who are still alive at that moment, with him in the air, Paul says. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Now, I don't think that Paul is referring here to something that's going to happen on an actual historical day, okay? Um, I don't think that he's describing or foretelling an event that's going to take place on a day like, say, October 26 in the year 2078. Now, I know that a lot of Christians have tried to turn passages like this into a prediction of that kind, but I, I just don't by that that's what Paul is talking about. I think this is spiritual language that Paul is using. And that it's trying to describe the scene that's playing out on the stage, as it were, that we walk onto when we die. When our histories have reached their destination. It's what we walk into when we're taken up into what Father Van Wiele called another dimension, what he described as another dimension, which we call heaven. That other dimension, this is the scene, the stage that we're walking onto when that happens. And what's happening on that stage is a reunion, Paul says. That's the point. It's a reunion. All of us, with all of our loved ones, indeed all of creation, meeting the Lord in the air, he says. Apparently we can all fly. That sounds nice. But the, the, the most important words of this description of what's happening on the stage of heaven are these, that we will be with the Lord forever. The we 
meaning all of us and all those whom we love, being with God forever. We'll have the chance to talk more about this during the season of Advent, because there are a lot of readings that describe this state of affairs coming up in the month of December. But this morning, I just want to hone in on the point of it all for Paul, the reason why Paul is bringing this up to the Thessalonians. He's not just interested in writing a theological tome. He's trying to address something happening in their lives, and it's the fact that they're worried. They're wondering if it's going to all be okay. And he tells them this so that, he says, they can encourage one another. Encourage one another with these words is how our lesson begins. And he says, it's so that we will not grieve as those without hope. It's not the case that Christians don't grieve. We do. We grieve when we suffer loss, when somebody has died, or when a hoped-for future or project doesn't come to fruition, or when we're disappointed by those we love. Perhaps we disappoint those we love. We grieve all of those things. Our world is a difficult and precarious place. I have a great, great uncle who once famously in our family said, it's dangerous to be alive. (laughs) And he's right. It's dangerous to be alive. That's part of the point, I think, of our gospel lesson this morning. You do not know the day or the hour. If we take all our ordinary day-to-day precariousness, the fact that none of us really knows when we're going to die when those whom we love are going to die, when we're going to reach our destination. When we think about that, that kind of precariousness, and then we turn on the news, I think we all know how the folks who participated in that study Bishop Tomlin commissioned felt. You begin to wonder, is it going to be okay? Am I going to be okay? Our whole society curled up in the back of my parents' station wagon, head in our hands, wondering where we're going. The point of Paul's letter, the reason why we read it this morning as we approach the season of Advent in just a few weeks, is that Paul is reminding us we have been made promises by God, just as my mother made a promise to me. We have made promises by God and Jesus Christ, whom we can trust. God has promised us to be with us when we gather together and take care of one another, first of all. God has promised us that even though in this world we will face trouble, even though it is dangerous to be alive, he will never leave us, nor will he ever forsake us. God has promised us that he will make all things new that he will wipe every tear from our eyes. And he has promised us that he will reunite us with all those whom we love who've gone before us, that somehow he will fix everything we seem incapable of fixing, even death itself, and that we'll all be with him and each other forever. He has promised us that history, our history, and the history of the whole world is going somewhere, and it's not off a cliff. And that no matter what is going on in your life, no matter how wild, how unnerving, how panic-inducing it might be, God has promised that in the end, in the fullness of time, it really is going to be okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand as you're able. Using the form found on page 358 of the prayer book, that's our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. Even one God, 
the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers are found on page 7 of your order of service. With all our heart and with all our mind, Let us pray to the Lord for the unity of the church in witness and proclamation of the gospel and for this community, St. Barnabas. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace and stability of all peoples and for the leaders of the nations, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this town of Greenwich and all the places where we dwell, And for all those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our annual stewardship campaign, for the joyful provision of resources to be a place of grace for a world in need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a blessing on our homes, for for parents, and for all those raising children in an unsteady and confusing world, And for all our families and friends, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aging, for growth in wisdom and dignity in weakness, and for the increase of our faith in your unchanging love, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who suffer hunger, sickness, or loneliness, for the poor and the oppressed, for prisoners and captives, and for those in any need or trouble, especially remembering Alex, Amanda, Austin, Betty, Charlie, Christine, David B., Della, Dr. Lisa, Eleanor, Elizabeth, Heather, Janet, Janice, Janine, Jennifer, Judy, Ken, Mary, Nicole, Roy, Sam, Steve, Tim, Tori, Walter, Wendy, and Quinn. For those in the armed forces, Logan, Parker, Peter, Mary Rose, and Morgan. For the people of the Holy Land, and for any others whom we name now silently or aloud. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died, whom we love but see no longer, especially Beecher Barry, sorry, Beecher Barry, and any others whom we name now silently or aloud, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Now may the peace of the Lord be always with you.
Let us share with one another a sign of Christ's peace in our lives. Good morning. Please be seated. A warm welcome to each of you, uh, especially to any of you who are new or visiting either in person or online. We would love to get to know you, so please do, if I've not met you yet, introduce yourself to me at the back or drop us a line uh, by finding my email address on our website or filling out the form. Speaking of forms, there's a QR code that you can scan on the back of your bulletin to fill out a form to sign up uh, and receive our newsletters and all of our uh, social media stuff, most of which features a pug to uh, bring, you, um, bring you some uh, uh, dog-inspired joy during your week. Uh, or you can also fill out the, the old-fashioned pew card, which is just in front of you, if you prefer pen and paper. A sincere thanks to all those of you who are helping us in worship this morning, to our altar guild as always, and to our readers, uh, to Susan who's serving with me at the altar, and to Jewel uh, who's going to join her to help us with communion, uh, to our choir this morning, uh, as always for our incredible music, uh, which I have to say is only going to get better. I, I got to hear the, uh, the communion anthem just before, and you're in for a treat, uh, but also for our coffee hour. Thank you all so much for, uh, for all of your labors. There is an incredible spread uh, in the parish hall. To find the parish hall, if you're new, you simply take a right out of the door, uh, go up the incline and take another right up some stairs and the parish hall is just there. And thanks finally to Susan and to her husband John for our altar flowers this morning. Just a few notes about our life together. This Tuesday at 9.30 a.m., uh, Aidan started our seminarian's contemplative prayer group, continues right here in the church. This is a, a blessed gathering of uh, some really beautifully hearted people. We had a wonderful, wonderful session this past Tuesday. So if you are curious about the life of prayer, please do join us Tuesday at 9.30. Children's Church, our Sunday for kids takes place twice a month. Uh, kids are always welcome in worship, of course, and we've got um, uh, Val's activity sheet uh, for those of you who are here this morning. Um, but I just want to say we had a fabulous time this past Friday night. Uh, on Friday night, we watched The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and we had 17 kids come out. It was fantastic. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing McLean here, who um, I, I think I, I brought popcorn to maybe 17 times, McLean. Uh, anyway, we had a great time, and thanks be to God. Thanks to all those of you who are here, uh, who um, uh, our little ones who came back to church today after coming to church on Friday, and um, we look forward to the next one. Marnus's first recital as our director of music is this afternoon at 5 p.m., I just have to say it's going to be spectacular. I've heard him practicing all week. You can hear this organ back in my office in the back of the building. Um, this is world-class music in a beautiful space to make it. If you're on the fence at all about coming, let me just say, just come, just come. We have one of the best organists in the world, and he happens to be a delightful human being. Uh, and so please come out and support Mars. Uh, it's just going to be fabulous, all right? And it, we're going to have a screen set up right here so you can even see his feet, okay? So you don't want to miss it, five o'clock. And now, um, Susan Jackson, our junior warden, to say a word about what St. Barnabas means to her in our stewardship campaign. Um, so tell me in the back if you can't hear me, and I'll try to speak louder. Um, I feel really bad about this because uh, the story I'm about to tell you doesn't have any blood in it. <laughs> the way Justin's does, but I'm going to try to tell you a good story anyway. So, a long time ago, in a faraway land, I was sent on a mission by the company I worked for then. I had to visit a plant we had in Naperville, Illinois, a little town outside of Chicago. Now, I know that many of you are going to find this hard to believe, but way back in the 1980s, there were no GPS systems for cars. <laughs> and worse still, there were no car phones. If you needed directions, remember this? You had a map. A map that some guy at Hertz had sort of wiggled a little uh, thing down with his magic marker and you were supposed to follow that little line while you were driving 60 miles an hour on a highway in a place you'd never been before. It was absolutely useless. I'm sure you won't believe this, but if you couldn't follow the map, what you did 
is that you went into a gas station and asked the person who worked there if he knew where you were going. To which I always expected them to say, why are you driving around, lady, if you don't know where you're going? So as was my practice, I had gotten up very, very early to catch the first flight to Chicago. At my very best, and I wasn't there, I got as I couldn't read the map, and I got as lost as one could possibly get. Really lost. The gas station attendant couldn't help me. He didn't even know where Naperville was, much less the address I was trying to go to. My only recourse then was to find a payphone. Anybody remember payphones? <laughs> remember the ones you found on the corners? And you would drive around and around looking for a payphone and hope it wasn't broken. So I found one that wasn't broken. And I dialed a nice man, at the plant manager, and I said to him, I am really lost. I am really lost. And you know what he said to me? He said, Susan, Susan, can you find the sun? And oh my gosh, the first thought that went through my mind was, Jesus is in Naperville? <laughs> but then it dawned on me when I came to my senses that he meant not the Son of God, he meant that orb in the sky that pointed east. He wanted me to go east. Eventually, I found the nice man, and I was very, very happy. But it occurred to me that the quest to find the Son of God belongs not on my road to Naperville, like the road to Emmaus, right? But right here at St. Barnabas, where we seek to know Jesus. We have been blessed over and over and over again in this past year by so many of you and our leadership teams, our calling committees, our vestry, our altar guild, Justin, Jewel, Marnus, Aiden, Lori, Alessandra, Reverends Chris and Meg, Crystal, Jocelyn, and Mia, who work in the kitchen and with the babysitters, Javier, our sexton, who has painted his little heart out, Victor, who works on the grounds, and our beloved choir, all of you who support the church. Next year, we want to do, we have great, great plans. We want to increase our social media with podcasts. We want to expand Children's Church to every Sunday. And we finally, finally want to finish the delayed maintenance on our campus so that every time it rains, we're not running around with buckets. <laughs> we also want to increase our contributions to outreach. But to make these plans become reality, we need help from all of you. We need you to increase your gifts to the church. Any contribution of any size is welcome. If you are new to the church and haven't made a pledge, please make one. If you regularly pledge, please consider increasing it. To grow, to become what we want to be in this community of faith, in our larger community, we need your financial help. So as I pondered my Naperville story, see, somebody else is pondering it too. That's <laughs> heavenly music, heavenly music, even somewhere. As I pondered my Naperville story, it occurred to me that one of the sillier things about my story is the assumption that the Son of God exists only in one place. Wherever we go, even Naperville, wherever we are, God's love surrounds us. But particularly here, in this sacred space where so many of those we love have gone before, by giving generously, let's do what we've done before. Let's make St. Barnabas a thriving, joyous community filled with love and laughter and the sounds of children. A place where all of us feel God's empowering love, where each of us can find the Son of God in the place where we are meant to be, right here with each other. And the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Susan.
Susan managed to thank almost everyone in leadership in the organization with the exception of herself and, uh, and as well as our senior warden David Harris. Just to say, uh, because you're up here uh, today, there would be no St. Barnabas without Susan Jackson uh, for her leadership and her love of this place during the interim period and also her continuing help to me, not least in um, writing all of the things which I managed to send to you. Uh, yes, John. John, thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. And to give credit where credit's due, it was all my wife Jules. Uh, Holy Communion follows here. St. Barnabas is alive with the Holy Spirit, and thank you all for your generosity uh, with your pocketbooks uh, to help make that real. And now I pray that you would set your generous hearts upon the Eucharist so that our Lord can give back to you a hundredfold. Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
Our service continues with Eucharistic Prayer A, found on page 361 of the prayer book. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. The night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. and When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, Do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed upon them in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
using the form found on page 365. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.